Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Frances Lannan, Principal of Lady Margaret Hall, and it is a very great pleasure for me to welcome on behalf of the University, the College, and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, each and every one of you, to this lecture this evening. The lecture is by our Humanitas Visiting Professor in Interfaith Studies, Lord Sachs, and it is the first in a series of three lectures and a symposium on the theme, Making Space, a Jewish Theology of the Other. Before I invite Lord Sachs to speak, I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor Guy Strumsa, Professor of the Study of the Abrahamic Religions and ask him to tell us about the wonderful Humanitas Initiative, of which this week's lectures and symposium are part. Uh, good evening, I'll be very brief. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, present the scheme of the Humanitas lectures, both Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, this Humanitas lectureship or prof visiting professorship is in interfaith studies. Uh, it will go on, it goes on for five years. This is the second year. Last year, Professor Jan Asman, emeritus Egyptologist from the University of Heidelberg, introduced the, 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 the Humanitas lectures and spoke on four different occasions from the Monday to the Thursday, like this year, on uh, ancient religions in the modern world. One of his lectures was devoted at least in half to the thought of Jonathan Sachs. Uh, he didn't know that I was planning to invite uh, Lord Sachs to come and be the second uh, Humanitas interfaith uh, professor, and I didn't know that professor that Lord Zacks would agree to come. But uh, but we 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 said that uh, if this happens, I would certainly invite uh, Professor Asman to come. He wanted very much to come. Uh, health for health reasons, he was uh, unable to come. But I just wanted to mention that there is a, a continuity even more than we planned to. Uh, the Humanitas, I want to say that the Humanitas scheme was created by Lord Weidenfeld, uh, who is very sorry he was here last year. This year, uh, Lord Zax's uh, diary is, of course, very busy, and the week that uh, we could have the lectures, uh, Lord Weidenfeld is not in the country. And the, this chair in interfaith studies was made possible by, by the generous support of both Mr. Xavier Guerrand Hermès in the name of the Guerrand Hermès Foundation for Peace and of Mr. Gil Shiva in the name of the Susan Stein Shiva Foundation. Both of them, again, were here last year. They are unable to come this year. They wish her as well. And we, no worries, and uh, they expressed their regrets that they couldn't be with us. In our turn, we express our thanks for their generous donation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Guy, and thank you to all those who've made the Humanitas Visiting Professorships a reality. Our speaker tonight needs no elaborate introduction from me or anyone else. However, I would like to say how honoured we are, Lord Sachs, to welcome you to LMH. It would be impossible to exaggerate the importance of interfaith studies for our contemporary world. We have a precious opportunity this week to hear someone whose contribution to interfaith studies is quite exceptional in both depth and range. Jonathan Sachs is the Chief Rabbi. 
He is a distinguished and award-winning author and scholar, a distinction recognised in the award of no fewer than 14 honorary degrees. As we know, he also continues to inform public understanding through radio, television and the press, and to contribute to public policy formation, not least through his work in the House of Lords. All of us who care about interfaith understanding owe him a great debt of gratitude. Lord Sachs will speak to us this evening on the topic after Babel, a Jewish theology of interfaith. Lord Sachs. <clears throat> Principal uh, Professor Strums of France, it is an enormous privilege for me to be with you here this evening to be privileged to sit in the same room as Dr. Francis Lannan, Principal of Lady Margaret Hall and Pro Vice Chancellor of Oxford University. Um, Professor Lannan, I, it's, it's uh, very humbling for me to be here and I thank you for the invitation. I thank Professor Strumza um, and uh, the um, Humanitas uh, Lectureship and uh, Oxford University and the Institute for Strategic Studies. In particular, uh, I thank um, Lord Weidenfeld and I just share with you um, a, little, uh, um, a little snippet that I caught in the Times uh, a couple of months ago. Do you know, in, the Times has this little thing where it lists everyone who has a birthday today. And it profiles one of the people who have a birthday that day. And three months ago, it profiled Lord Weidenfeld, who was just celebrating his 92nd birthday. And they asked him, Professor Weidenfeld, most people, Lord Weidenfeld, most people as they reach the age of 92 think of slowing down. You seem to be speeding up. Why is that? And he replied, when you get to be 92, you can see the door beginning to shut. <laughs> and he said, I have so much to do before the door shuts that the older I get, the harder I have to work. Now, we should all be like that at the age of 92. So for the irrepressible and effervescent Lord Weidenfeld, uh, I uh, thank him for the whole concept of these lectures. And let me, begin, let me kick off, as it were, with the first of three on making space for the other. I want to begin, um, because I have so much ground that we have to cover in this first lecture, and, and I'm going to do so really in shorthand, but let me begin by sketching out the road uh, that I want to travel. Now, I take it for granted that every single sentence I say for the next 50 minutes can be challenged, and there are counter-arguments. But I, help, I find that it sometimes helps, when you're short of time, to be challenging and provocative, and that's the way you start a conversation. I know it would be ideal to be so intellectually um, sophisticated that you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, uh, but I just don't have the brains to do so. So I'm going to be very blunt, and if you disagree with everything I say, I will accept that as absolutely appropriate and right and something, in any case, I'm used to working within the Jewish community. So, let us begin. Proposition one. The good news about religion is that it's about God. The bad news about religion is it has to be lived by us, frail and fallible human beings. And though we are made in God's image, sometimes we forget that other people are as well. And the result is as I have had occasion to say in the Lords recently, that there have been occasions when religion has led people to hate in the name of the God of love, wage war in the name of the God of peace, practice cruelty in the name of the God of compassion, and murder in the name of the God of life. <clears throat> 
What is remarkable about the Hebrew Bible is that it candidly acknowledges this from almost the very beginning of the human story. Genesis chapter 4 talks about the first recorded act of religious worship undertaken by the first two human children, Cain and Abel. And the result of that first act of religious worship is violence, murder, fratricide. So, uh, and so far from uh, being what God had in mind, that we read in Genesis 5, a mere one chapter later, possibly the most poignant words in the whole of religious literature. God saw that the inclination of man was only evil from his youth, and God regretted that he had created mankind by Yitatse Valibo, and it pained him to his very core. So there is nothing in the nature of religion as such that is proof against humanity's ability to distort it in directions that God never intended and to do harm instead of good. Indeed, something much stronger is at stake because as the text of the Bible makes clear in Genesis 4, Cain, just before he murders Abel, God realizes that he is on the brink of a terrible crime and warns him against doing so. He says, If you do well, will it not be accepted? But if you do not, then sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you can prevail over it. So God knows that a terrible crime is on Cain's mind. But... He neither intervenes to prevent Cain, nor does his warning to Cain have the desired effect. Cain goes ahead and murders Abel anyway, which led me to the following statement, which I made in the context of the Holocaust. And I, I said it in these words. If God speaks and human beings don't listen, then even God himself is powerless. Because of God's self-denying ordinance, the God places on himself not to intervene to prevent human beings from the consequences of their actions, the terms and conditions of the free will that he grants us as beings in his image. So the first point I make uh, very simply is, do you, does anyone remember... I'm uh, sorry, I, I'm dealing with people of my age here, so I ex exclude. But in the late 1970s, there used to be an advertisement for some motor car, I can't remember which, which said, designed by robots, driven by idiots. <laughs> so, I mean, in the spirit of that remark, human beings were designed as the image of God, but they do not always act by the word of God. So... Uh, religion is, um, is a dangerous phenomenon, and the Bible candidly acknowledges that and says so explicitly at the beginning of the human story. That's number one. Number two, what does it take for religions to pull back from violence? Again, I'm going to be very brief and cryptic and controversial. But it seems to me that for religions to go through that soul-searching that leads them to pull back from violence, something has to happen. It is not enough for religions to wage war against its perceived enemies. To that process, there is no natural end, except disastrous defeat or total exhaustion. The thing that tends to pull religions back from the brink is when they find themselves killing not their enemies, but their friends. The centuries of war between Christianity and Islam in the age of the Crusades did not lead to a fundamental rethink within either Christianity or Islam. What led to change was the sight of Catholics and Protestants at war across Europe 
from the Reformation to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. That is the thing that made the difference. It is only when Jew kills Jew, Christian kills Christian, Muslim kills Muslim, that there is a profound soul searching within religion and something new emerges. And that something new is a new and forceful separation of religion from power. And uh, so let me state that second point in a slightly different way. What led to secularization, which began in Europe in the 17th century, was not that people lost faith in God. The heroes, the intellectual heroes of the 17th century, Isaac Newton, René Descartes, believed in God very much indeed. What led to secularization was not people losing faith in God, but people losing faith in the ability of people of God to live peaceably together. And thus the search began in the 17th century in Europe, first for a basis of power, then for a basis of knowledge, then for a basis of civil rights, and eventually for a basis of culture that did not rest on dogmatic foundations and thus could be shared by anyone regardless of their religious dogma. So that is point two. Um, religions pull back from the brink of violence through inner schism and sinat uh, war. Number three, point number three. What then happened? by the 18th century and the 19th century was the emergence of an intellectual consensus with fateful consequences. And that consensus was that religion was going to disappear. It was deprived of its power. It would therefore forfeit its influence. And one way or another, religion was in intensive care and would not pull out. And you heard that in every self-respecting intellectual of the 18th and 19th century, Voltaire, uh, sorry, Laplace says, je n'ai besoin de cette hypothèse. Voltaire says, écraser l'enfant. Uh, Matthew Arnold hears the lonely, long, melancholy roar of the retreating tide of faith. Nietzsche uh, talks about the death of God. Every self-respecting intellectual regarded religion as uh, on its last legs. In other words, the cure of religion would be its demise. Now, I want to say something about that. Um, and this is my intellectual difference of opinion with Richard Dawkins. Um, I believe that there is such a thing as bad religion, and I believe there is such a thing as bad science. Somebody wrote a book called Bad Science last year. Um, there is such a big thing as bad science. What is the cure for bad science? Good science. It is not no science. So there is such a thing as bad religion. The cure for bad religion is good religion, not no religion. And that is where, uh, you know, I dare to disagree with Richard Dawkins and um, his American counterpart, Sam Harris. However, the truth is that nobody did that work. Nobody did that work because they thought, we don't need a cure for bad religion, it's going to die. The cure is going to be no religion. I don't want to go in at length into what I define as bad religion. I have a chapter on that in my new book called The Great Partnership. Simply, religion contains things called hard texts that we have to wrestle with. I think religion, and this is Professor Strum's speciality, the occupational hazard of monotheism is neither atheism nor polytheism, it is dualism. Uh, I think dualism is a profoundly dangerous doctrine. I think messianic politics, the attempt to bring 
the end of time in the middle of time is a profoundly dangerous doctrine. I believe the association of religion with power is a dangerous doctrine. So there are four or five markers of bad religion, but that I write about in the book, so I don't need to uh, talk about today. But by and large, um, the, um, the uh, people who were critical of religion did not see the solution in good religion, they saw the solution in no religion. So, um, and by and large, those many theologians who dealt with the issues arising out of 18th and 19th century thought did so in relation to religion and science. Now, religion and science are really not a very interesting subject. I even wrote a whole book on it. As I say, it's called The Great Partnership. But it's not a really interesting subject. What they did not deal with is the serious question, which is religion and the other. Whether that is the other within my own faith or the other outside my own faith. And such work has been, as has been done on religion and the other has mainly been done since the Holocaust. That and losing the final solution, the hor horrors of the Holocaust, was what provided the impetus for interfaith, and it is a profoundly important development. But as I say, once, for the most part, the, the great religious thinkers of the modern age were confronting uh, the Age of Enlightenment by looking at religion and scientific truth and various other issues, but not dealing with religion and the other. So, point three, the assumption was that we didn't need to look for good religion because there would be no religion. Point four, religion didn't die. And that is the extraordinary phenomenon. Already in 1832, Alexis de Tocqueville, after his visit to America, wrote the following words. Uh, 18th century philosophers had a very simple explanation for the gradual weakening of beliefs. Religious zeal, they said, was bound to die down as enlightenment and freedom spread. It is tiresome that the facts do not fit this theory at all. What uh, Tocqueville expected to find in America, a land with the First Amendment separation of church and state, was that if religion was deprived of power, it would be deprived of influence. Instead, he discovered that having been deprived of power, Religion had a very great deal of influence. Indeed, he called it the first of America's political institutions. The even odder fact is that 180 years later, it still is. Did you know that more American, a higher percentage of Americans, go to a place of worship once a week than they do in the theocratic state of Iran? Did you know that? 40% of Americans go to the house of worship once a week, only 39% of Iranians do. And uh, one way or another, religion didn't die. And it, that is really extraordinary. I mean, you know, where, sorry, anyone know where the fastest growth of Christianity is today? In China, yeah. China, the land that Chairman Mao declared religion free. There are more people on, in church on Sunday than there are members of the Communist Party. So religion didn't die. That is the extraordinary fact. It is even more extraordinary if you think about it. Every task once done by religion has now, is now done by something else. To explain the world, you don't need genesis, you have science. To control the world, you don't need prayer, you have technology. To prosper, you don't need God's blessing, you have economists. Uh, maybe I should refrain that. Maybe you do still need God's blessing. Uh, to control power, you don't need prophets, you have democratic elections. If you're ill, you don't need a priest, you go to a doctor. If you're guilty, you don't need to confess. You need to go to a psychotherapist who will tell you that everyone else is guilty. Instead, if you're depressed, you don't need faith. You can take a pill. And if you are in search of salvation, you can visit today's cathedrals, which are shopping centers, or as somebody rather handsomely called them, weapons of mass consumption. 
So, here we are with religion superfluous, redundant, and de trop, and yet it survives. And there is surely no doubt that the 21st century is going to be a more religious century than the 20th was. Why is this so? Again, to be very brief, the four great institutions of modernity, science, technology, the liberal democratic state, and the market economy, all four of them are incapable of answering, indeed, in principle, do not answer and will not answer the three questions, fundamental questions that any self-reflective individual will ask him or herself, namely, number one, who am I? Number two, why am I here? And number three, how then shall I live? Those are questions we are almost bound to ask. And there is nothing in science, technology, the liberal democratic state, or the market economy that will answer them for us. Religion remains because Homo sapiens is the meaning-seeking animal. And as I put it very simply in The Great Partnership, science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. Religion is not our only source of meaning, but it is our most uh, rich repository of meanings. That is not to say that everyone is convinced that life has a meaning, uh, but nonetheless, the great profits of meaninglessness, uh, whether they be uh, Nietzsche or Sartre or Camus, or my own doctoral supervisor, whom I admired enormously, the late Sir Bernard Williams. These people, these, these prophets of meaninglessness have not proved as compelling an account of the human situation as religious accounts of meaning have. So, if my point three was religion was expected to die, my fourth point is religion didn't die and has returned with full force in the 21st century. Meanwhile, the other great ideologies of the 20th century have come and gone. Fascism has come and gone. Communism has come and gone. Secular nationalism has come and gone. Religion has come and stayed. And that is an eventuality no one contemplates. So, number five, we need new thinking. Specifically in relation to one question. What does faith tell me about the other? The radical other, that is, the one who does not share my faith, my way of life, my culture, my creed, or my code. And it is now clear, I think, that this is quite a difficult problem for religion. Let me explain why. Do we find it problematic that different cultures should coexist? The answer is no, we don't. I enjoy French landscape painting, German symphonic music, Japanese design, I'm sure you all do. The fact that we have multiple cultural allegiances is not problematic. Cultures uh, can coexist and none threatens the other. So, um, just as a, a person can speak many languages without suffering an identity crisis. There are, it is equally clear that some uh, truth claims cannot coexist. Um, either there was steady state or there was Big Bang, either there were, you know, etc. But somehow you can't imagine people resorting to violence to solve that conflict. I mean, did anyone ever fight anyone over whether Aristotle was right in his critique of Plato's theory of forms? I, I mean, I suspect not, you know. It's just not the thing you fight wars about. So truth can clash, or truth assertions can clash, but that's not the kind of thing over which you go to war. What do you go to war over? Liverpool versus Manchester United. I mean, obviously, or, or they nearly did last Saturday, I think. Uh, I, I missed the intricacies of that. Does anyone know? 
Did anyone work out what all this insult was about? I, I know uh, nobody was best pleased, but there we are. What generates wars? Answer, anything that calls for and evokes loyalty. That is the key issue. Loyalty addresses what might pejoratively be called the tribal instinct. And it is that that creates violent clashes. But the truth is, we all, or almost all, seek identity. An identity is found first and foremost in our group. And the nature of a group is that it's bigger than anyone, but it's smaller than everyone. That's the nature of a group. And religion is the most powerful expression we have of a belief that calls for loyalty. That is why religions unite and divide. They unite as they divide, and they divide as they unite. How do I mean this? Religion has the power of turning a lot of me's into a collective us. It unites. But for every us, there is a them, the people not like us, and therefore it divides. As it unites, it divides. It creates a group, but that group is partially defined against other groups. And religion evokes very powerful group loyalty. And therefore, um, that is why religion has become, as has always been, a source of conflict in the world. Now, there are two critiques of what I would call loyalty. Um, number one, there is the cosmopolitan alternative, which says, no, we're not loyal to anything, but we dabble in this and dabble in that, from pilgrim to tourist, as uh, Zygmunt Bauman calls it. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. My grandmother's recipe for chicken soup. Um, that's the cosmopolitan alternative, or you have the universalist alternative, that there is one truth for all of us. Now, cosmopolitans, for whom I have an enormous... I mean, Amartya Sen has written a book on that recently. Anthony Appiah has written a book on it recently. There are lots of books advocating cosmopolitanism. But the trouble is, cosmopolitans do tend to congregate in the company of like-minded cosmopolitans. So they are not exactly as cosmopolitan as they really believe. They are also a group of their own. It is the universalists who offer the other real challenge that there is not a group, there is simply humanity. And uh, that is going to be our issue over these three lectures. So um, point three then is the question of questions is, can there be loyalty without violence? So now let me move on to the next point. Can, how do you answer that question? How do we answer the question, how can we live with difference in the 21st century? And that answer will vary from religion to religion. In Christianity, it may well be that you answer that question by doing theology. I don't know, I'm not a Christian, but that may be the Christian way you do it. In Judaism, the way you do it is through biblical interpretation. That's how we've done everything in Judaism. Jews spent a thousand years in real time compiling the books known as the Hebrew Bible from, uh, let's say, 13th century BCE to the 3rd century, last of the prophets, mm -hmm. a thousand years. They then spent a thousand years from the 3rd century BCE to the 7th century CE writing a commentary to that book, which they called the Oral Law, Midrash, Mishnah, Gemara. And they then spent another th thousand years writing a commentary to the commentaries. I mean, writing commentaries to the commentary. So in Judaism, when you want to face a challenge, that is a challenge of self-definition, you can only do it, or only successfully do it, by biblical interpretation. And that is what I'm going to be doing. Now, again, let me explain 
very briefly what I mean by this. To cut a long story short, Greek thought tends to see truth as system. Jewish thought tends to see truth as story. And the book of Genesis, which I think has very rarely been accurately interpreted, if ever, I mean very rarely, the book of Genesis is in fact a book of philosophy and theology in the narrative mode. And therefore, whatever new insight we seek into Jewish views of the other, we will find it in the Hebrew Bible, and we will almost certainly find it in the book of Genesis. And that is where we have to look. And that is what I'm going to do. So, <clears throat> let me tell you my starting point. We have really significant work to do by looking at the book of Genesis. And as soon as we open the book, we see exactly what the problem is. Genesis 1 to 9, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, Babel and its builders, are about humanity as a whole. Genesis 12 stops talking about humanity as a whole and focuses on not archetypes of the human condition, but one particular individual, Abraham and his wife Sarah and their children and their family who have become a nation, who are not archetypes of humanity at all, but are in some sense examples, role models, what have you. Judaism, I mean Genesis moves from the universality of the first 11 chapters to the particularity of the Abrahamic covenant. And if you look at those chapters very carefully, you will see something very remarkable. That they are framed fundamentally by Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. In Genesis 1, we are told that God created man in the image of God. In Genesis 9, we are told that God created man in the image of God. Those two chapters frame the human story. How does it work? Genesis 1 tells us how God created the universe. Genesis 2 to 3 tells us how God created humanity. Genesis 4 to 6 tells us how humanity, well, um, as uh, my grandmother used to say, uh, you know, if we hadn't phoned her up in the week, been ich disappointed, you know, and, and that's about God's, value judgment on humanity, you know, been ech disappointed. So humanity is a great disappointment to God, and the result is um, chapters seven and eight, uh, 6 and 7, the flood. The universe so carefully created is de-created. And we are left at the end of the flood with the world as it was in the opening chapter, uh, in the opening verse of Genesis 1, with the earth uh, waste and void and the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. And with Genesis 9, God begins a new human era, a new creation. And both, and that whole symmetrical chi chiastic structure is framed by the phrase uh, of God creating man in his image in Genesis 1.27 and in Genesis 9 verse 6. But there is a difference. In Genesis 1, God says, let us create man in our image after our likeness that he may, what does it say? Uh, ha have dominion over the fish of the sea and the etc., etc., so on and so forth. Genesis 1, it's a statement of power. In Genesis 9, it is a statement of restraint in the use of power. What does it say? He who sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God created he man. So whereas humanity being created in God's image in Genesis 1 is a statement of human capacity, human power to dominate, in Genesis 9 it becomes a restraint on the human capacity to dominate, particularly dominating others by the use of violence and murder. So we have Genesis 12 with a new beginning, this time not with Noah, but with Abraham. And therefore, the problem we have to face is, what is the link between the human story 
which begins with Adam and culminates in Noah, and the particular story which begins with Abraham. What is the linkage? What is the explanation of the change? And the answer to that must somehow lie in Genesis 10 and 11. So we have to take a magnifying glass to Genesis 10 and 11 if we are to get the answer. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but Genesis 10 and 11 stand in the same relationship as Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 are two ways of telling the same story. They are the story about creation. But they tell it in ways that are radically different. Genesis 1, you know, God said, let there be, and there was, etc., etc. Genesis 2, God plants a garden in Eden and then uh, fashions man out of dust of the earth. And those two creation stories, side by side at the beginning of the Bible, are from completely different perspectives and conflict in many respects. Genesis 1, uh, the first narrative, man's created in God's image. In the second narrative, he's created out of dust of the earth. In the first image, man and woman are created simultaneously. In the second narrative, first man, then woman. A different name of God is used in the two chapters and so on. So you have two pictures standing side by side, but very different. If you now read Genesis 10 and 11, you will find they do use exactly the same literary technique. They tell the same story, but very differently. And what is the story? How one humanity came to be divided into many different nations, cultures, and languages. Genesis 10 tells us how humanity naturally divided into 70 nations, each with their own language. In Genesis 11, we are told the opposite story. It begins with... And all the earth was of one language and shared speech. And then they wanted to build the Tower of Babel. And then God came and confused the languages. Go back, if you have the chance, tonight and read Genesis 10 and 11. And you will see they tell the same story, but they tell it very, very differently. Um, this, incidentally, is telling us that Jewish thought doesn't function the way Greek thought does. The fundamental principle of Greek thought is the law of contradiction, either P or not P, whereas Jewish thought says P, not P, you know, this, is, this statement is true, it's also false, and you come along and you say, how can a statement be true and false at the same time? And then the rabbi says, you're also right. Jewish law doesn't operate on the law of contradiction. Jews have arguments, but they don't have contradictions. Anyway, uh, so Judaism never works. The literary technique of the Bible does not work by creating a consistent and, co and, and self-consistent system. Jewish thought, or biblical thought, proceeds by carefully constructing a field of tensions. Now, let us step back and look very carefully at the story of the Tower of Babel. The story of the Tower of Babel is a very sophisticated literary artifact. I don't know if you've read the work of J.P. Fockelman. He was the first person to show exactly the literary structure of that narrative. It's chiastic. It begins and ends with the same words. And all the earth, and all the earth was of one language. From there, they were scattered through all the earth. Uh, in the middle comes the word heaven. There's a lot of assonance, sham, shem, shamayim. Uh, there, there are a lot of word plays and so on and so forth. So you read that very brief story of the Tower of Babel and it looks like a literary artifact. The odd thing is that historically it is extraordinarily well grounded in, um, in historical fact. Um, the Tower of Babel is a ziggurat. There were 31 Babylonian uh, Mesopotamian city-states that had ziggurats. Most of them carried the inscription, this is the gate of heaven, or the top reaches to heaven. Um, the tallest of them the, was in Babel, and uh, it reached over 300 feet. It was in seven stories. And not just for centuries, for millennia, it was the t tallest man-made structure for millennia. The Bible uses a wonderful... I, I, most people don't realize when they read the Bible that God has a sense of humor. And uh, there's a wonderful use of divine humor in the Babel story. 
and one we've only been able to understand since the use of aeroplanes. Because the makers of the tower say, let us build a city and a tower that reaches heaven. So there it is. It actually reaches heaven. Uh, but, and then the verse says, at Vayered Hashem Lirot, God had to come down to see it. Where is this, this <laughs> tiny little thing? And of course, only now, traveling at 30,000 feet and looking down at 1,000 foot high buildings, do you realize, yes, the, what seems so huge to us doesn't seem so huge to God. So there's a wonderful piece of irony. There's only one thing that makes God laugh, which is human beings taking themselves seriously. So, despite this fact, as I say, this is deeply grounded in historical realia. And one major fact shines through, which is that Mesopotamia becomes the first environment in which empires appear. The first environment in which powers conquer other powers and impose their culture on the defeated. And both Sargon and Ashurbanipal II claim, uh, proudly say in triumphal inscriptions, we imposed our language on so that everyone, anyone uh, under their rule spoke, whatever they spoke, I've forgotten from what did they speak? I'm sorry, Ugaritic? I, I can't remember, Acadia. actually. What? Acadia. Acadia. So they, this was imposed by the imperial conquest, and these early kings, Neo-Assyrian kings, boast of this. And suddenly we realize that is what the statement of the first verse of Genesis 11 is about. This Fact, the whole world, the whole land, not the whole earth, the whole land, was of one speech and a shared vocabulary, is of an enforced shared speech by imperial conquest. In other words, an attempt to frustrate the natural process, which has already been described in the previous chapter, which talked about the emergence of 70 languages and human diversity. So we, Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, is a story rooted in the fact that the one language is not some utopian harmony and some golden age. It is, in fact, what the 19th century Jewish commentator, the Natsiv Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, intuited when he said that Babel is the first totalitarian. This is not an ideal harmony, it is an imposed <coughs> uniformity. Babel is cosmopolis. And we now see that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are constructed on an extremely precise pattern. They are A, B, B, A, it's a chiasmic pattern. It begins with Adam and Eve, whose sin is that they transgress a boundary. They eat the forbidden fruit, they transgress the boundary between permitted and forbidden. It proceeds to violence and murder, Cain and Abel, and then the same sequence in inverse order is then applied from the individual to the collective so that we have collective violence in the generation before the flood, and then finally the Tower of Babel which transgresses a boundary. It does so in three different ways. Number one, when they say we will build a city and a tower that reaches heaven, they are transgressing the first boundary, the first words. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. As the book of Psalms says, the heavens are the heavens of God, the earth he has given to man. So man's domain is earth, God's domain is heaven, and the builders of Babel, by seeking to reach heaven, are transgressing the divine human boundary. Secondly, um, they are attempting to frustrate God's command in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. They attempt to concentrate in a city, and we have this critique throughout the Bible of urban civilization. But thirdly, it attempts to transgress the natural boundaries that God has created when he creates diversity. Read Genesis 1, and the key recurring word is laminehem, lamino, lamina. He created plants, animals, birds, fish, laminehem, according to their different kinds. The essence is, of Genesis 1 is ordered 
diversity. And that is what the builders of Babel are trying, and order diversity and hence you get in Leviticus 19 the prohibition of mixing wool and linen. We know the prohibition of mixing milk and meat, sowing a field with different kinds of grain and so on. This is the priestly ontology, ordered diversity. And by attempting to suppress the individuality of those nations they conquer and their distinct languages, the Mesopotamians, the builders of Babel, transgress that boundary which God has created. In other words, biodiversity in Genesis 1, human diversity in Genesis 10. It then follows that um, Babel is the first of the Bible's two meta-narratives. One takes place immediately prior to the birth of the covenantal family with Abraham. The other takes place immediately prior to the birth of the covenantal nation in the days of Moses. And both of them are critiques of empire. Genesis 11 with its critique of Mesopotamia, Babylon, the uh, Assyrians, and so on. And number two, the critique of Egypt, the two great empires of the ancient world. And we can now define the programmatic theology, political theology of the Bible, the Mosaic books, and Genesis and Exodus in particular. They are critiques of empire and imperialism. We sometimes forget because Judaism is quite old, that the Bible presents Judaism or Abrahamic faith as a latecomer, not as the original faith of humanity. By the time Abraham appears, Mesopotamia is already old. By the time Moses appears, Egypt is already old. Jews are portrayed as latecomers. And the Judaic project is a critique of empires and imperialism. And I can now define imperialism in the same words that I define religious fundamentalism today. Imperialism, like fundamentalism, is the attempt to impose a single truth on a plural world. If this is true, then we do not have to search far for a theology of the other in Judaism. Judaism itself begins with a theology of the other. It is the radical otherness of God that is expected to lead us to respect the radical otherness of different languages, nations, and cultures. As the missioner in Sanhedrin puts it just about 18 centuries ago, when a human being makes many coins in one mint, they all come out the same. God makes every human being in the same mint, in the same image, his image, and we all come out different. The miracle of monotheism, as I read the opening of the Hebrew Bible, is not one God, one truth, one way, but that unity in heaven creates diversity on earth. The principle that I call the dignity of difference. And it is the attempt of the builders of Babel to suppress that diversity by imposing the language of empire on conquered peoples that leads God to abandon the whole project of a universal human narrative and turn to the particularity of one person and one story as an example and signal that we all have our story. So I hope that is a good starter for um, some angry or anguished questions. But there it is. I have begun at least by showing how the Bible in Babel sets the tone for the dignity of difference. What the implication of that is for the nature of truth, for that, please join us tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed.
Middlesex, thank you for such a wide-ranging talk, uh, one with so many challenges for us to think about, and also, I think, a kind of optimism that challenges us as well. Um, Lord Sachs has a tight schedule this evening, tighter, I think, than it will be on the next two occasions, but we have a few minutes for questions. So, would anyone like to start us off? If not, I will come right in. I'm going to begin then, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about otherness and also your second point about how religions can learn to step back from violence and how they might do that when friends practice violence against friends and then there's a resistance from that. Um, but I was just thinking about the ways in which uh, great religions seem to be able to reconstruct friends as enemies by calling them not authentic, not authentic Christians or not authentic Jews or not authentic Muslims. Um, and I wondered how that creation of new othernesses within religious traditions, uh, how that seems to you. Ah, that's the difficult question. You know, for, you know, to make friends with my enemies, that's easy. To make friends with my relatives, that's extremely difficult. Uh, and there is no doubt that sometimes the intra-religious schisms are more intractable than the inter-religious schisms. There's no question about that. Uh, but then, um, although I'm not a, you said, uh, you use the word optimism. I, I tend to use the word hope. I, want, I once did a dialogue with George Steiner, and he sent me a little note, which is one of the nicest notes I have ever received. It said, you made my ignorance seem hopeful somehow. I'm not sure what he meant by that, but it was an extremely lovely sentiment. So I'm full of hope. So here is a hope-inducing sentiment. Jews and Christians have been estranged for the better part of 2,000 years. But in the wake of the Holocaust, we have come together in interfaith dialogue. Indeed, it was at that dark night, darkest of all nights, towards the end of 41, uh, beginning of 42, more or less exactly... 70 years ago, that a great Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, and a great Chief Rabbi, J.H. Hertz, came together to create the Council of Christians and Jews. And so, um, and of course, all Chief Rabbis, Hertz, Brody, my predecessor, Lord Jukovic, and myself, have been Jewish presidents of that. And it suddenly occurred to me that if I, as a Jew, can sit together with Christian leaders, how come I can't sit together with other Jewish leaders who are not Orthodox Jews? And so we use this, uh, this Jewish-Christian encounter as a way of solving the Jewish-Jewish encounter. So today I sit flanked by um, a liberal rabbi, a reform rabbi, a Masoreti rabbi, and a Sephardi rabbi, there are five of us and five of them, and so we use the interfaith encounter to ease some of the tensions that are intra-faith. And the same thing happens in the other direction because uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, sits together with uh, the Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, the moderator of the Free Church, the uh, head of the Church of Scotland, and, and uh, Archbishop Gregorius of the Orthodox Church. So you have tensions there within Christianity which somehow are resolved because you're sitting with a bunch of rabbis. And we have a problem with Judaism which is solved because you're sitting with a whole bunch of bishops. So actually you can use the one arena of friendship to create the other arena of friendship. And it turns out that that synergy of goodwill is immensely creative and problem-solving. So if you want to make friends uh, between religion, uh, within a religion, make sure there are some members of the other religion in the room. Yes? One well, quick question right at the back, and then we'll yeah. have to leave it there for this evening. So you've been talking the last before, and you pointed out that when the Ethiopians immigrated to Israel in the late 80s and 1990s, they did a lot of 
Yeah, I, I, I think what has happened, in, uh, you know, it's happened to various uh, uh, strata of immigrants to Israel is, you know, Israel, like the United States, is one of those countries basically populated largely by asylum seekers. And there was the question in both countries, do you allow people to stay with their traditions and cultures, or do you create what they call in America the melting pot? Um, and uh, actually it was a Jewish playwright called Israel Zangwill who wrote the play called The Melting Pot, which, you know, which, which saw that the great thing about America is all those multiple identities that people brought with them from Europe, which led them to kill one another in Europe, they were, were going to divest themselves of when they came to America and they could become something altogether new, this new type of person called the American. Uh, but of course, you know, several generations later, people felt that actually we want to stay Jewish or Catholic or Amish or what have you. Um, and the same thing exactly happened to Israel and it happened to the early, uh, settle, uh, the early refugees from Arab lands between 48 and 51, the people who came from Yemen, and of course the people who came from Ethiopia. And the first effort was get them to integrate let them forget they were Yemenites or from Morocco or from Iraq or wherever, and become Israelis. And gen two generations later, that is seen to be a kind of assault on what was a very historically rich form of identity. Ethiopian Jews had a very distinctive identity. Yemenite Jews had a distinct, you know, I mean really distinct distinct traditions, cultures, language, cuisine, all sorts of things. So I, I think that first instinct to, you know, jettison everything that made you Ethiopian or made you Yemenite uh, was done with the best of intentions. But in the end, you know, I, th I think um, I stick with that phrase, the dignity of difference. And that really is what makes a country beautiful. I mean, you go in Britain now, you can hardly go to uh, an inner city school in any city in Britain and find less than 50 or 60 different ethnicities. And, and that is a very enriching thing, if you can somehow bind them together. Uh, that's a different issue, and I wrote a different book on that called The Home We Build Together. That's a, itself a complex issue, but that's to do with political theory. It's not to do with theology. So, you know, I think... Ethiopian Jews uh, enrich that culture by staying Ethiopian and creating that new Ethiopian contemporary Israeli synthesis uh, with its wonderful music and its wonderful color and cuisine. Thank you. We, mu we must draw this to an end for this evening. Please join us tomorrow. And let's thank Lord Sachs once more for a very stimulating lecture. <laughs>